Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and Governor, thank you. Um, the last time I saw the governor, uh, he and I were both testifying at the legislature on uh, Initiative 1000, which, which passed, and I'm happy that it did. So great to be here talking about transportation. Um, wanted to talk about how transportation matters uh, to the state of Washington, a little bit about our agency and our strategic goals, the issues of workforce, the issues of inclusion, the concept of practical solutions that we're bringing into the work that we do, and then talk about the next 10 years and some of the trends that we see uh, in the transportation space and hopefully have some time for Q&A. Um, transportation matters to Washington's economy. Uh, we are one of the more trade-centric states in the country. Uh, our gross business income related to trade is well in excess of, of half a trillion dollars a year. Approximately 1.4 million Washingtonians uh, have a job in uh, the trade sector. And we're doing all of that moving of goods and services on a landscape that's not particularly fashioned for it. The, the beauty that is Washington State makes it doggone hard uh, to move a container across it, either east or west or north and south. Um, if you're familiar with Seattle, it's, you're all right here in the middle of, of the hourglass um, geographically that, that is uh, the world that we move through. Uh, so we're moving a bunch of people and a bunch of stuff in a very challenging landscape. Uh, transportation matters to our quality of life. Um, climate change is an issue. And in Washington state, because most of the sources of our power are, are cleaner, you know, they're hydro, um, over 44% of the greenhouse gases emitted in our state come from the transportation sector. So doing something about that's important. It's going to matter to us. It's really a huge part of affordable housing. Uh, the traffic that we all love to hate, um, there used to be a t-shirt, uh, welcome to I-5, where there's always lots of free parking. Um, you know, we, uh, it's significant, that traffic, but it's, it's not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. And the problem is that we have a lack of affordable housing and transportation choices for the citizens we serve. The notion of driving to you qualify is great, but if you drive out into Snohomish County or out into Pierce County, uh, that old um, paradigm falls apart because it's based on a limitless supply of cheap congestion-free transportation that we just don't have anymore. If you're working eight to 10 hours a day and hopefully sleeping eight hours a day, you don't have a lot of time left to do everything else. So you're gonna spend all of that time with your friends and neighbors out on I-5 or are you gonna do something different? So affordable housing and transportation are, are hugely linked. Public health. Uh, public health is, is uh, fatalities and serious injury accidents on our system. It's air quality issues related to transportation, water quality issues related to transportation, public health issues related to transportation. A huge part of America's obesity problem is related to the fact that a lot of people move from the kitchen to the garage, get in the car, park it in the garage, move to the office, and, and repeat in the evening and, and do that five days a week you're not getting a, a lot of exercise. You know, you drive to the health club to walk on a treadmill. That, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In Washington State, one of the reasons that a lot of us live here is access to nature. We're in an urban space really close to stunning physical beauty and incredible, incredible activities that we all choose to do at the same time on Friday at 3.30 on I-90. Um, <laughs> or on Sunday at 3.30, coming back the other way and, and enjoying um, you know, the, the, the beautiful landscape on the other side of Snoqualmie Pass. Um, access to nature is huge, access to recreation is huge, but there are issues related to that. Something that we're realizing more and more, that transportation matters in Washington State because it provides access to opportunity. If you think about your household budget, and the percentage of your budget that's dedicated to the care and feeding of your fleet of vehicles, um, in the upper third of the incomes, it's, that's less than 10% of the family's income. There's a lot left over to do other stuff. But in the lower third, it's twice that. And having a, a land use transportation relationship that's set up that requires every family to have at least one, quite often multiple cars and, and, and care feed for them, 
takes resources that, that working families could use for better housing, for better education, for health care, for things like a vacation, for saving up for retirement. Um, those things are not being invested in because we're investing in cars. And then you have to remember that 20% of us are either too young or not able or not permitted um, or don't want to drive. That's 20% that's of, of the population that as Secretary of Transportation, I need to take care of as well. So lots of people in our state are using public transportation, and that, that's a great thing. But the access to public transportation, you, you're gonna walk or ride a bicycle, you're gonna walk or roll um, at the beginning of the end. So active transportation is hugely important. When you think about the fact that 40% of the trips that we take are less than five miles in length, 40%. But we take 60% of those short trips in our cars. Um, the last time I talked about this, I was at the South Center Mall in a hotel. I said, you're at the hotel, you wanna go to a restaurant over there, are you gonna walk across? Or you'd be crazy to, it's just nuts. You get in your car and you've got your, your you know, protective cage around you. So access to opportunity is a huge part of what we do in the transportation space. I'm tracking four trends. I want to kind of list them briefly, talk a bit about our agency, and then get back to them in the context of WashDOT. Uh, the first trend is resilience. And depending on your value system, your beliefs, what you think about this stuff, resilience could be resilience in the face of climate change, which I believe is happening. Um, it can be resilience in the face of the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, which is going to happen. Um, people ask me, you know, the, we were talking about the tunnel and the viaduct. Where do you want to be when the earthquake hits, Mr. Secretary? I want to be dead and buried 200 years myself. Um, but, uh, you know, if and when it happens, uh, we have to be ready for that. Uh, resilience could be uh, having a resilient economy. There are lots of, of things that resilience could be, but we need to talk about it. Alternative energy and the decarbonization of the transportation sector is happening globally. We need to be, we are a part of it. We need to be a bigger part of it. The, the advent of technology in the transportation space and the private sector rediscovering opportunity in the transportation space is huge. Um, we operate a bunch of legacy systems that the private sector found to be not so profitable. Passenger rail, ferry boats, buses. But with the advent of these technological advances, the private sector is coming back into our space in a much bigger way. They're already there if you're Ford, Chrysler, GM, you know, Toyota, what have you. But a lot of other people are, are getting into the space with tech and it's gonna be disruptive. And then governance and financing, the relationship between uh, federal government and state government and local government and the private sector and how we pay for all this stuff is huge. So let's talk about WashDOT. Um, we are one of 52 state transportation agencies. Uh, the 50 states, the District of Columbia and, and, and Puerto Rico. Uh, we have a vision, we have a mission, we have values. Um, there, you know, if you look around at the other 51, you'd probably see a lot of the same words. But our strategic plan that we just adopted has three goals that a lot of people go, well, what's that have to do with transportation? Inclusion, workforce, practical solutions? They, they don't sound like the, the traditional strategic plan goals about getting the farmer out of the mud or you know, whatever you're gonna use depending on, on what century you're in. Um, you'll see why those are important to us. We are stewards of a bunch of stuff. Uh, lots of highway miles. I, I tell people, if you're looking for highways, we got them. Um, but we've got other things uh, too, uh, with the ferry system and, and uh, passenger rail and airports and public transportation and the like. When I was first uh, introduced to this job uh, back in, in 2015 when I was deputy secretary, all my friends were, wow, connecting Washington past $16 billion, great day to be uh, an executive in the transportation sector because you got all this, all this money to play with. I said, well, what's the system worth and how much should we be investing in this asset that we have? And nobody knew the answer to that. We had little stovepipe discussions about pavement and bridges and stuff, but you know, what's WashDOT worth? Now you, know, you fill in your own snarky line there. Uh, but what the dollar value, we didn't know, uh, now we do. 
it's approaching $200 billion. And when you have a $200 billion asset, you also have a $200 billion liability. You have to invest in state of good repair. We have calculated we should be investing $1.2 billion a year in state of good repair on our existing transportation assets. As of last biennium, the biennium that'll end at the, at the end of June, we're spending $550 million a year. Uh, the legislature, in their wisdom, cut that amount by $90 million for the next biennium. So we are over $700 million a year short of the money to keep up the stuff we already have. It's like buying a roof for your house that's guaranteed to last 20 years and planning on dealing with it in 40. At some point, your living room furniture is going to get wet. And, and what's going to happen in Washington state is that a, a secretary of transportation is going to have to make the decision to load limit bridges on the interstate system so that full trucks can't travel to our ports and to reduce speed limits on our highways because it's not safe to drive 70, uh, to tie up ferry boats because they're not safe to operate, to, to turn off systems so that we don't have catastrophic failure. This is a, a serious, serious issue. It's not particularly sexy. It won't get you a lot of votes, but it's something that we need to deal with as a state. Um, we are statewide bunch. If you look at WashDOT, they, you think about a building in Olympia, a particularly unattractive building in Olympia, but uh, we're in every community in Washington State. Uh, it's where we work. It's where we live and own property and our kids go to school there and, and we pay taxes and vote. Uh, anyway, six regions. We have a lot of highways that we deal with. Uh, East-West interstates, north-south interstates, um, state highways, U.S. highways, the like. Lots and lots of miles, 18,000 miles of them and all the bridges that go with it. Uh, we're unique in North America. Uh, there are other DOTs that own a ferry boat or two. But we have the largest ferry system in North America and the second largest ferry system in the world. And uh, we provide 25 million rides a year on that system. Uh, we're very involved in railroad infrastructure. Um, we work with the Burlington Northern and the Union Pacific that are moving freight through our state. We fund and contract with Amtrak to provide the Amtrak Cascade service. We also work with Amtrak on the, the east-west service and the Coast Starlight. We actually own 300 miles of uh, short-line freight track in eastern Washington uh, that moves uh, grain to market. Um, and uh, we work with all the other short-line operators as well. Um, when you think about public transportation and aviation in Washington state, you think about SeaTac and Sound Transit. But our role in public transportation is more important to the citizens we serve in the Okanagan and out on the Olympic Peninsula and, and, and down in South Central Washington where people who can't drive have very few choices. So we're, we're working with transportation, you know, public transportation agencies all over the state. We're working, uh, providing a lifeline intercity bus service uh, for citizens who need that service. And we also work uh, with airports big and small around the state of Washington. What we're hoping to do more and more of is work with regional governance. And this, when you, you think about the United States and our, our constitutional structure and how we're set up, we've got a federal government, we've got a state government, we've got a local government. Local governments and economic regions quite often don't match up. Local governments and environmental sheds, air sheds, water sheds, what have you, quite often don't match up. So we've begun to experiment in that it's been 50 years or less in regional governance. And in Washington state, there are 16 either metropolitan planning organizations or regional transportation planning organizations um, from the PSRC, the Puget Sound Regional Council, on, on whose executive committee I sit, on down to uh, the, the group in the Okanagan and the, the Quad County RTPO that might have a full-time staffer. Uh, but they're out there and we are working with them more and more. So three strategic plan goals, workforce development, inclusion, and practical solutions. We can't deliver our program without people. 
And in the Washington State DOT and in the transportation industry, in agencies, at contractors, offices, uh, in consulting firms, the baby boom generation is aging out of the workforce. If, if you look at our approximately 7,100 employees, many of them are eligible to retire. 31% of our maintenance force is eligible to retire. And the institutional memory they're taking with them when they retire is really, really hard to replace. 40% uh, of our engineers are eligible to retire. And the ones that aren't eligible to retire are eligible to make a whole heck of a lot more money working for Sound Transit. And uh, so we're, we're shedding engineers left and right. The men and women who drive our ferry boats, 75% of them are eligible to retire. And that's not a license you pick up down at, at the DMV. Um, that takes decades of skill. So workforce development is an issue to us because, again, no people, no program. Compensation is a huge issue for us. Civil engineers at the Washington State DOT earn 35% less than their compatriots in local government. And I want all of you who are civil engineering students to come work for me even though I pay 35% less than the city of Seattle, than Sound Transit, and what have you. Um, our, our, our benefit package is good, but it's not great. Um, we're working on that. The, the problem we run into is that the public at large believes that bureaucrats like me um, are way overcompensated, and that we get a pay raise every year. Now, I came on board in 2015. The men and women at Washington State DOT did not get any raise from 2008 to 2015. And in 2015, they got a 3% COLA, cost of living allowance. And, and that's pretty much what happens in state government because the, the legislature votes up or down on union contracts for most of our employees. They don't get to fiddle with them. They get to vote yes or no. And the governor and the director of our Office of Financial Management have to figure out how big a box they can get over the top, over in the legislature. So they identify a number that they think they can get a yes vote on, and all of our compensation has to fit under that number. So I'm working with the university system and DSHS and corrections and all the rest of those folks on how do we pay our folks as, as well as we can. And in that context, um, it's, it's not particularly a, a, a good place if, if you're looking to provide great compensation for your employees. So we're working on other stuff to be an employer of choice. Uh, one thing, we've got really cool projects and programs, and we, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of exciting to be doing what we're doing as compared to some of the other stuff, and I'll get into more of that in Practical Solutions. Uh, we also provide the ability to work a, a flexible schedule. 60 plus percent of our employees are working something other than a, an eight to five, 40 hour week. Almost 15% of our employees are telecommuting, because I'd rather have them telecommute than and go take a job somewhere else. We developed an infinite work program. Um, we lost a lot of people. Uh, uh, their first child would be born. They'd tell us they'd be back, and they didn't come back. That first six months of life is very, very, very expensive child care. It's, it's a different kind of child care than, than later. So what we said, we tried it as a pilot. We said, bring your kid to work for those first six months. They start crawling around. Then you got to take them to daycare. But as long as they're just kind of a lump there in the room, bring, bring your kid to work. Um, maybe not if you drive a snowplow, but most of our folks are in an office environment. Um, and put a playpen in the office. You know, you, you, we, we'd work out a deal. You know, here's the agreement. Here's how we're going to work. We started it as a pilot in two of our offices. And by the end of the day that we started the pilot, we expended it company-wide because uh, the demand was there. Um, Talking to our employees, it has a 98% positive response rate. Um, Productivity is great, and the loyalty it engenders is just incredible. That, that we do that for families, they, they stick around. And what's really interesting is half of the employees who bring kids to work are men. So it, it's stuff like that that we can do that's a little out of the ordinary that maybe will help us respond to this workforce issue. Inclusion is also huge to us, and that's why the I-1000 conversation was so important. Right now, the majority of people in Washington State are Caucasian. Within a generation, there will be no majority. 
And that's a demographic reality. Births, deaths, in migrations, out migrations, you do the math, we're changing. What we do about that reality speaks a lot to who we are. And the way I describe it, if I had a really tough problem to solve at the Washington State DOT, and I gave it to two teams, same problem, two teams. One team's made up of 10 of my fraternity brothers, and they're gonna tell you how good the University of Virginia basketball team is because we won the national championship, and don't forget it. Uh, but you take that other team, and it's a couple of my fraternity brothers, and some women, and some people of color, and some people who weren't born in Washington State, some people who weren't born in our country. Two teams, where am I gonna get the more creative solutions to my problems? Obviously, from the team that has the broader and deeper resource base to draw from. So the fact that we're becoming a more diverse society makes Washington State stronger. Stronger in terms of our economy, stronger in terms of our quality of life. It's, it's, it's a really, really good thing. And so what we're saying at WashDOT is we want the people who work for us to look like the people we work for. And we are working towards that. More women, more people of color in, in our workforce. We want to work with any Washington business that's qualified and willing uh, to contract with us. And we want our projects and our programs to be culturally competent. That's hugely important to us. I-5 and I-90, they move our economy. But if your family grew up in South Seattle or the International District, the Washington State DOT tore your community apart. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted's a famous landscape architect. Um, beautiful, beautiful facilities. Um, did you know that Spokane had an Olmsted Park? It's under I-90. It's the path of least resistance. That's how we used to build stuff. We need to be culturally competent. Um, we spend a lot of time on that. Um, we're spending a lot of time um, bringing uh, women and people of color into the construction trades. As, as fun as it is to code, we're trying to get people to recognize there's good money to be made uh, in the construction trades in the transportation sector. 15% uh, of all the hours worked on our contracts have to be worked by apprentices. That's, the, that's our, our goal. We're actually achieving close to 19%. And 44% of the men and women who are working in that apprenticeship program are, are people of color and, and women. Um, we are bringing uh, diversity to our, our construction trades. And we, in our um, pre-apprenticeship support program, are putting money into things like childcare and lunch money and bus passes and things that young men and women need so they can get the training that they need uh, to move forward. Another thing we're doing is a mentorship program with our friends at the Association of General Contractors and the American Consulting Engineers Council where majority owned firms are mentoring minority uh, and women owned you know, disadvantaged businesses, showing them the tricks of the trade because the, the technical skills to do construction, a lot of them have. Uh, the wherewithal to deal with an agency like mine, not so much. So the, they're, they're getting that, that, that training and, and we're bringing uh, diversity into our uh, construction and consulting engineering workforce. So what about the program? Um, now that we've got people delivering it and those people represent all of us, uh, we do a, a lot of stuff. We build a lot of stuff. Um, when something goes wrong, you hear about it right up front on the front page of the Seattle Times. Now, when we opened the tunnel, uh, it wasn't on the front page. There was a snowstorm that day. But then uh, somebody got wind that we were a little late and taking the viaduct. That was right up on the front page. Um, it's important that you recognize, because I mean, you're, you're our customers. Um, the nickel and Transportation Partnership Act programs, two programs that the legislature funded, 382 projects, nine out of 10 on or under budget, nine out of 10 on or ahead of schedule. Connecting Washington, the, project, the program that was passed in 2015, we've got 18 projects completed so far, 100% on or under budget, 90% on time. That's not bad. Uh, I had a citizen call very grumpily that he, the ferry he was on was late, and why couldn't we have on-time performance like Alaska Airlines, damn it. Um, Alaska Airlines has the best on-time performance in the industry. They're 88% on time. 
So I really, really struggled and did not tell the gentleman who called that, you know, if we were to decrease our on-time performance, we could match Alaska's because the Washington State Ferry System is 92% on time. We do good work and we're recognized for it. We win awards. I just got back from Washington, D.C., where the Alaska Way Viaduct Program received the Grand Conceptor Award from the American Consulting Engineers Council. Thousands of, of applications, 16 finalists, the, the tunnel and the viaduct removal won the top prize for 2019. In 2017, we won the grand prize for the 520 floating bridge. All the projects in the world, two out of three years, Washington State DOT. Um, the reason I brag about that is if you have a policy difference with me or, or my boss, if you think we ought to be going about our work a different way, let's have a policy discussion. But too often these days, the conversation gets down into competence and integrity and attacks on character. And it's really, really important for you to know that if you disagree with our policy direction, and there's nothing wrong with that because nothing I ever did got better because everybody agreed with it, do not attack the integrity and the competence of the men and women of Washtenaw, because they, they do the job. And we do a lot. We're very good at developing and delivering projects. These are the projects that are in the Connecting Washington pa package, where they're at, and I could get into infinite detail on that. Uh, just in the Puget Sound, there's a lot more. And then stuff that really doesn't go on the map in terms of multimodal and active transportation investments. We're really good at developing and delivering projects. What we have to get really better at is managing a system, being stewards of a complex, expensive, multimodal transportation system. When I first got the job, I, I got a call from a citizen, an email from a citizen, congratulations. By the way, all your speed limits say 60 miles an hour. I can't drive 60 miles an hour on I-5. Your agency is a failure. I said, well, that's great. What would it cost? so that everybody that lives here today could get in their car anytime they wanted and drive 60 miles an hour on I-5. It's $115 billion of construction. In some places, four lanes in each direction of additional capacity. If we were to build that over the next 10 years, it would only take an increase of $2.50 in the gas tax. We pay 49.4 cents today, so for $2.50 more, you can drive 60 miles an hour anytime you want. If you live here today and we don't let anybody else come to, to Washington, because that does not account for growth, it does not account for induced demand, and if for some reason you were crazy enough to give us the money to build all of that state highway, what happens at the end of the off-ramp? Who's gonna build the city roads and the county roads and the parking garages to accommodate that, that growth in, in traffic? Um, and what are the environmental consequences, and do you want to live next to that facility? Um, uh, James Bass is the director of TxDOT, and I was teasing him. I was down in Austin a few weeks ago, and teasing him about the Katy Freeway in Houston. Eight-lane wide highway. It took 70 minutes to go 10 miles. The legislature got upset about that. They invested billions of dollars, and the Katy Freeway is now 23 lanes wide. And three years after they opened the 23 lane wide facility, it takes longer to get from one end to the other than it did before they started construction. So I get a lot of grief from the Washington Policy Center and others for saying that you can't build your way out of congestion. It's economically, it's geographically, it's physically, um, it's aesthetically impossible to do. What we have to do is manage the situation we're in. And we're here with 7 million people in our state. I came to Washington from Billings, Montana, population 125,000. You know what they complain about? Traffic congestion. <laughs> from Billings, I lived in McCall, Idaho, before Billings, population 2,500. Traffic congestion. You can't turn left on the highway on the weekend. We got traffic congestion. It's just, it is a reality in our lives. So what we need to think about as an agency is a way forward in a, con in a congested world. We call that practical solutions. It's addressing congestion with the resources that are realistically available to us, making the right investments at the right time in the right locations. 
it's not necessarily, the fix isn't necessarily on our system. It may be another type of fix altogether. But we need to be stewards of our system. We need to recognize that we have a huge asset. We need to make sure that it operates safely. We need to make sure that it operates efficiently. We need to manage demand for it. And sometimes we add capacity to it. But it's, it's a little more complex and nuanced a conversation than the answer is a new lane and a new interchange. So state of good repair. I'll show you some really attractive pictures of our system. Um, the picture on top, you're looking at the Columbia River through the bridge deck on I-82. Uh, the picture on the bottom is from the fire suppression system on the Ship Canal Bridge. Uh, we had a fire, the bus from uh, the track team that, that burned up on I-5. When the fire department got there, they went to the hydrant and there was no water. And they went 1,000 yards down and they found another hydrant. And that, that took some time and sometimes that time can be critical. Uh, there was no water because that system is not maintained. That system is not maintained because we need a billion two and we get 460. Um, so state of good repair is a huge issue for us. There are things we're doing in pavement and structures and intelligent transportation systems and the like. But one of the things we're doing in pavement is we are transitioning our asphalt highways from being primarily hot mix asphalt facilities to being primarily chip seal facilities. 10 years ago, most of our facilities were hot mix asphalt and we paved a mat of asphalt on them. Today, um, if we're approaching two thirds and I think it's gonna stabilize at about three fourths of our flexible pavements are chip seal. And the ride quality's gone down and the safety's gone down, but it doesn't cost us as much to maintain them. And when you, you, know, you, you either fund the system you want or you get the system you fund. And that's where we're at with state of good repair. We also have issues of right-of-way management. The, you know, other than congestion, the argument I get from most people is about all the trash on the highway. What's WashDOT gonna do about all the litter on the highway? Well, I'm gonna ask you to stop littering. That would be a great start. <laughs> Tarp your load. Um, when we look at our, our maintenance budget, we have to plow snow, we have to repair guardrails, fix potholes. Litter is, is in that mix. It's, it's ugly, but it's, it's not as mission critical as the other stuff. Uh, vegetation management. It, remember when I was a kid, the freeway right away looked like a golf course. Now we have a no mow, no spray policy. Um, that's good environment, good environmental um, policy. It's also good economic policy because we're not paying to mow stuff and we're providing habitat for pollinators, which is really good. Um, homeless encampments. That's another place where we're asked to address a symptom of a problem. Move those people out. Great, where? Where do I put them? And who's gonna protect my crews while we do that work? We'll send a sing, sing, single individual out to work on one of our traffic control cabinets and they'll go down the hill from the highway and there's a half dozen um, homeless people um, who are quite often more the victims of crime than the perpetrators of crime, but it's not a safe situation for me to put an employee in. So when we do homeless cleanups, uh, the police need to be there, social service workers need to be there. It's, it's a complex, complex issue. Safety is huge. We're a target zero state, safety first. And quite often when you hear somebody say safety first, it's so we can get it out of the way and go on to adding capacity to our system, um, unfortunately. I was in Copenhagen. Uh, the, the city government in Copenhagen was just appalled that last year five people died on their system. Five. We're a target zero state, and when the Amtrak Cascades train crashed and three people died, I was brought to hearings in the, the Senate and the House, and we had international coverage of it because three people died. Did I feel bad about that? I was, I was asked, you know, you're responsible. Do you feel bad? I absolutely feel bad about that. And that same week, 10 people died on the highway. And the week before that, and the week before that, and the week before that. 540 people a year on our highway system die in Washington state. And the number's not going down. There's a lot that we do in terms of, of incident response and infrastructure investment and the like. But again, the money isn't being spent in this area. Another place we spend a lot of time talking about uh, is managing our system. TISMO, Transportation System Management and Operations. TISMO is, is really hot in our world right now. I 
um, on the steering committee for the National Operations Center of Excellence. That's TISMO, ITS America, that's TISMO. Uh, the Cooperative Automated Transportation Coalition, that's TISMO. It's about traditional traffic operations. It's about um, mobility on demand. It's about connected and autonomous vehicles. It's about transportation demand management. It's about planning and partnering and policy development to do a better job. It's about taking the stuff we own and getting more out of it. This is a NACTO drawing of a typical 10-lane arterial street um, that in the 20th, 20th century, you could move uh, 30,000 vehicles and people uh, on that particular piece of road. But by applying technology and management systems, you can bump that up to closer to 80,000. And that's a great hypothetical, but we're doing that. We're doing that. We've invested a billion dollars in intelligent transportation systems in Washington State. Some of it's really popular. Um, our I-405 express toll lanes are really, really popular. Um, the Seattle Times did a poll. 70% of us don't like tolling. Anybody here like tolling? I don't like tolling. I mean, pay a toll, why? I, I want to write for free. Uh, how about a tax? I don't want to pay a tax either. How about, you know, and of course it's going to poll poorly. Um, but it works, it works. This is, on the left, Interstate 5 um, at about 130th Northeast, 105,000 cars a day. On the right, I-405 at 85th, about 107,000 cars a day. This is a typical rush hour, peak hour uh, situation. Five lanes of traffic in each direction on both facilities. I-5 is four general purpose lanes and an HOV two lane, high occupancy vehicle lane. I-405 is three general purpose lanes and two express toll lanes where you can ride for free if you've got three people in your vehicle or you can pay a toll to ride in that lane and the toll goes up or down to manage the speed that uh, those lanes are operating at. Same pavement, same concrete asphalt steel, we're moving 35% more cars in the peak hour on the express toll lanes. 35%. Do you know what it would cost us to add 35% of physical capacity to that facility as opposed to putting in cameras and collecting money to pay for the cameras? 35% uh, more. And when you move from cars to people, it's even more than that. And that's before we put bus rapid transit on I-405 and start moving um, high capacity transit in that quarter. So we're doing some really cool stuff there. Um, our transportation management centers, if you have a chance to go visit the TMC in Shoreline, it's, it's really cool. Lots of TV cameras and stuff. Our ramp meters, uh, the express toll lanes I talked about, all the other stuff we're doing, even down to a, a reservation system on Washington State ferries. Not particularly high tech, but the system works a lot better with the application of that technology. And we're beginning to put other things in place um, in the cooperative and automated transportation world. Uh, one that I'm particularly interested in is mobility on demand. I'm chairing, co-chairing the Mobility on Demand Alliance. It's a part of ITS America's uh, portfolio. The idea is that your mobility device is your phone and you ask your phone, I'm here, I wanna go there. It gives you a half dozen ways you can go with the cost of the trip and the time of the trip and maybe the environmental consequences of the trip, or if you're like me, how many Fitbit steps you're gonna get if you take one trip versus the other. So you get all these choices, you pick one, it does all the financial transactions for you and gives you all the permissions to go. Really cool. Um, it will allow us to leave our cars at home or not own one because we'll have certainty that we didn't have before that we can get from here to there at a reasonable cost in a reasonable period of time. But we need to think about, okay, what about the Americans with Disabilities Act? Does everybody get that opportunity? Is this just for rich people? You know, the, what are we gonna do? Is this gonna compete with public transportation or leverage the investments we've made in public transportation? That's the stuff we need to be talking about in this TISMO space and where civil engineers in particular need to stand up and be a part. We're very engaged in transportation demand management, in commute trip reduction, in shifting uh, people's modes of transportation and making investments off of our transportation system in uh, land use and the relationship between transportation and land use. Um, 
those are important topics, and I'll talk about that a little more in the trends part here at the end. And then capacity. Don't let anybody say that, that Roger Millar said, we don't want to add capacity to the transportation system. I have no problem with adding capacity to a highway if it's the right thing to do after we've tried everything else because everything else is cheaper and faster and generally better. But there are some situations where you need to add capacity. The, the um, North Spokane Corridor, if we're gonna develop that industrial base, we need to add capacity. The Puget Sound Gateway, that we just got the, the ability to bond toll revenue to build and actually accelerate three years faster, that keeps the Port of Tacoma and the Port of Seattle competitive in a global marketplace and it provides the opportunity to create jobs in South King County and Pierce County where people live so they don't have to get in their cars and drive up to Seattle to go to work. That's, that's good policy and, and good investment if we do it right. We also need to add capacity to Washington State ferries. Ridership's going up and we're gonna have to have the boats and the crews to, uh, to accommodate that ridership or the idea that there's cheap housing on the other side of the sound uh, becomes uh, a, a dream just like having cheap housing in, in Snohomish County. We need to add capacity to Amtrak Cascades and we need to invest in ultra high speed rail. Ultra high speed rail, it's a $40 billion price tag. For $40 billion, you could get from Portland to Seattle in an hour or from Seattle to Vancouver in an hour. That's a lot of money. If you asked me to have our agency add a lane of traffic, a lane of highway, two I-5 in each direction from Portland to Vancouver, it would cost $110 billion. It would probably take just as long to build as the ultra high speed rail. The lane would be full by the time we got it built and it would still take you all day to get from Portland to Vancouver. So ultra high speed rail makes a lot of sense for this region. It'll help us maintain our global economic uh, competitive position. We need to make that investment sooner or later, and it ain't gonna get any cheaper. We need to invest in active transportation. We have been. Uh, we created an active transportation division within our department. We're investing in safe routes to schools. We're investing in, in first mile, last mile connections. Our programs are hugely oversubscribed because our, our, our constituents want these facilities, and we're having a hard time keeping up with that given the funding we've got. Um, the last thing about practical solutions is, somebody asked me, what's, what's your quickest, simplest description of practical solutions? And it's, it's about aligning our investments with our values. It's about aligning the transportation investments we make with the policy goals we've established as a community. Congestion in Washington State, you hear all the time about how being stuck in traffic is impacting Washington's economy. It costs us three and a half billion dollars a year in lost productivity. We're spending almost a billion dollars a year on mobility projects chasing congestion. State of good repair costs the economy four billion a year, and we're spending about 400 million a year fixing potholes, bridge decks, that kind of thing. Deaths and serious injury accidents alone, not counting property damage and all the rest of that, costs our state's economy eight and a half billion dollars a year. WashDOT safety program, $50 million. So if we're aligning our investments with our values, uh, we're not, <laughs> and, we, and we need to do something different. Um, that's something that I'm hoping that we'll be talking about with our constituents, with the legislature, uh, with leaders in local government, and ports and transit agencies and the like as we move forward into the next 10 years, which are gonna be incredibly disruptive. 1900, there's one automobile in that picture. 1913, there's one horse. It was not a good time to be a farrier in America. Um, is it a good time to be a truck driver in America today? Or an auto manufacturer? What, you know, the disruptive nature of the, the things that are gonna happen in the next 10 years. Let's look at resilience. Again, are we ready for climate change? Are we ready for the big earthquake? Are we ready to support a resilient economy? We have a $3.1 billion fish passage obligation over the next 10 years. We have seven billion that we need to provide for preservation to meet the unfunded need. 
We have a billion five in Western Washington just to bring all of our bridges up to seismic standards. We need a, another billion easily in safety and system operations programs, and we have these modest projects like the I-5 bridge over the Columbia River, or the US-2 trestle between Lake Stevens and Everett, or uh, State Route 18 over Tiger Summit, or completing I-405 and 167, or doing something about I-5 between Marysville and Tumwater. None of this is funded today, none of it. Alternative energy, the decarbonization of our transportation systems. Worldwide, we're moving away from the internal combustion engine. We're, we're moving away from oil and gas to electricity, to hydrogen, to, to other ways of, of getting around. Other countries are investing in it. Other cities are investing in it. Um, we're investing in it. We need to do more. Uh, EV charging stations. We're converting our ferry fleet to be hybrids. They're going to run on batteries with diesel for backup and diesel for when the big earthquake hits. Um, transit, we're converting our transit fleets to electric power. And we were just talking about um, uh, the public service transportation for uh, the disabled and elderly and, less, and changing that fleet over uh, to something that's decarbonized. And then e-bikes and scooters and all the fun we're gonna have with those. Uh, technology, the cooperative automated transportation, that idea that your computer's gonna drive your car. My computer's never failed me, has yours? <laughs> Uh, but uh, that, that said, um, the, the industry says we're going to have automated cars next year, next decade, next, uh, somewhere in the future. We're 99.9% .9 of the way there. Swiss, a German friend of mine said, 99.9% .9 of the way. Now imagine you're climbing Mount Everest. Fly from here to New Delhi. You're 99% of the way there. <laughs> Fly to Kathmandu, 99.9%. .9. Trek to the base camp, 99.9, .9, you're 99.9% .9 of the way to the top of the mountain. All you gotta do is climb it. <laughs> it is a significant issue getting to a place where you have SAE level four or less or five, level five automation. Uh, but that said, and, and my skepticism aside, I love the new tech that's moving into our, our, our vehicles. The blind spot monitoring, the adaptive cruise control, the automatic braking systems, the thing that keeps you alert um, there's a, a thing that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has developed that can tell when you get into the car whether you've been drinking or not. There's tech that we can deploy that'll make us safer and more productive. Um, and looking forward to that and looking forward to more and more of that private sector intervention in what we do. Funding and financing are the last two cheery subjects I'll, I'll bring up. Um, the federal gas tax has not been raised since 1993. If the Congress were to double the gas tax, and I'm not holding my breath on that, but if they doubled the gas tax, it would have the purchasing power that it had in 1993. So we'd be back to where we were 25 years ago, which is not moving forward. Right now, you, know, you think about I-5, I-90, the interstate system, um, 80 to 90% of the money that was invested in that system was federal money. It was a real easy budget conversation. I got 90 cents, give me a dime, and I'll go build a bunch of stuff, keep a bunch of people busy. Right now, the federal government is uh, funding 20% of Washington's transportation system. The, the money that's in the system is ours. It's more real. Uh, they're harder conversations. Uh, looking down at the local level as opposed to up at the federal level, a significant issue that we have is the relationship between transportation and land use, particularly as it's codified in the Growth Management Act. The Growth Management Act is incredibly good legislation. It's been around for 25 years. It's served the state well. The GMA specifically exempts state transportation facilities from consideration by local governments when they develop comprehensive plans and when they review and entitle development. So local governments and developers have realized the way they solve their transportation problems is move them as quickly and as cheaply as they can to a state highway because then it's not their problem anymore. It becomes all of our problem. A great example of this is in Spokane. If you're from Spokane, you might know it, but uh, south of I-90 and west of US-195, a hillside that was in the urban area that Spokane wanted to annex into the city. It wasn't connected to their city street system at all. It was an <coughs> isolated island. Um, we identified you need to build an arterial. It's gonna cost you $40 million. 
They didn't want to spend the $40 million. The developer didn't want to spend the $40 million, which I would posit to you, that would indicate to me that the development isn't viable if it's only viable if you subsidize it with a $40 million investment rather than having the development pay for it. What they did instead is they entitled it without the investment. So there are thousands of homes there today, and the neighborhood streets are great, but to get to work from those neighborhoods, you go down to the bottom of the hill to a stop sign, and you turn left across five lanes of 65 mile an hour traffic. And people have died at those intersections, and it's on us. So we're looking at fixing that problem. The fix on our system is $450 million to solve a problem that could have been solved with $40 million up front, or could have been solved for nothing by redeveloping redevelopable land in Spokane rather than um, sprawling out all over the landscape. I pick on Spokane because it's a particularly egregious one, but we got them everywhere. They're, they're, no one is, is immune to that, and we're just as, as guilty as the rest of everybody by just sitting by and letting it happen. So we're raising that issue. Um, and then the last thing is, how are we going to fund all this? We have a 49.4 cent gas tax. You know what electric vehicles pay for gas? Maybe nothing. Um, and we're seeing that decarbonization of the, of the, of the transportation sector. That's going to be interesting. Uh, nobody likes tolling. Nobody likes congestion pricing. Nobody likes road user charges. Those are the tools that are in the toolbox that we're going to have to be talking about. But when you look at where the funding we have today comes from and where it goes, um, everybody assumes since Washingtonians paid the third highest gas tax in the country that yours truly walks around with a great big checkbook to solve everybody's problems. Uh, 49.4 cents. Back in 1998, we had eight cents of gas tax that went to fund everything the Washington State DOT does. 12 cents goes to cities and counties. And then we did the nickel and we did the TPA and we did Connecting Washington. So that money is all legislatively directed. The legislature doesn't say, here's the money, go manage the system, Mr. Millar. The, the, the legislature says, here's the money and here's a list of projects to build. So it's 100% earmarked funding to build projects and build programs. So what we've gone to the legislature and said, and what I just did with the legislature is, we don't have the money to operate and maintain the system we have. We need, we need funding. And what we get is, here's some funding to build some more stuff that you don't have the money to operate and maintain. And we, we've been doing that for a while now. But when you look at 2029, in 2029, 52% of our gas tax will be going to pay off bonds for stuff that's already built. We'll have a little bit of money left down there, that 2.9 cents for the earmarks. And then, assuming we keep it, we'll still have our 8 cents, and local governments still have their 12 cents. It's not going to buy what it bought in 1998, or even what it's buying today. So you're going to have a whole generation of elected leaders with constituents who want change, and they won't have the resources to make it happen. So we've got to do something different. We have to come up with a system that accounts for cost of living, a system that is responsive to um, our land use policies and our economic policies and the like. You can see right now, if you look at the money we had back in 2003 and compare it to the money we have today, we've lost a billion dollars a year to inflation, even with the increases in the funding that's available to us. And look 10 years out, it'll be $3 billion a year because our revenue streams are not particularly progressive. And like I said, there's the percentage of the gas tax uh, that goes to pay off bonds. So I'll leave you with the idea that we need to align our investments with our values and we need to step back as a state and talk about what we really want out of our transportation system, recognizing that first and foremost, it has to be safe and it has to be operated and maintained in a state of good repair. We need to look at a strategy. It's gonna take some time to develop that strategy. We need to ensure that our legislative policy goals shape our investment decisions, that our investment decision-making is, is evidence-based. Uh, now it looks more like what happens on the Serengeti when a wildebeest goes down, you know, between the lions and the tigers and the bears. Um, we need to improve our project quality, and that's not the quality of what we build, but the quality of what we scope. Um, we need to be more cost-effective with the limited funds that we have, 
And we have to have a long-term vision. We need to, rather than saying these are the projects we need to build, we need to talk about here's the funding we have available. Here's what needs to be spent on the stuff that we have. Here's what we've got left. If we need more, how are we going to raise it? We need to have that conversation. We need to have that conversation, I believe, through our metropolitan planning organizations and our regional transportation planning organizations. They need to have the resources to do that job right. Those are regional councils of cities and counties and ports and transit agencies, and the DOT's at the table too. Let's have those 16 conversations around the state, roll them up into a statewide conversation, and have a rational policy for how we invest in designing and building and operating uh, the system that is so important, that matters so much to all of us. So I hope I've left you with the impression that transportation matters, that WashDOT delivers. I'm, I'm very proud of our agency. Uh, that workforce is a huge issue for us, that inclusion is going to make us a better agency and a better state, uh, that we are delivering today's programs, but we need your help uh, to move Washington forward in a congested world. So thank you very much. <laughs>